For the first time ever, the Big Ten Tourney is in the land of 10,000 lakes. Minneapolis, the fifth city ever to host this celebration of Big Ten basketball. Five days, 13 games, one champion. The journey begins here this evening. As we welcome you in, it is Big Ten today. We are presented by Old National Bank. Thrilled to be alongside Rafael Davis and Andy Katz. I am Dave Revson. It's tough to think of a day that I enjoy more on the sports calendar than this one. As we kick off the week, the showcase of Big Ten basketball, it is always so much fun. It's fun to bring it somewhere new this year and tons of storylines to get to in the next hour. It's always a big time week. This is where the stars come out and play. I'm very excited to see who comes out and who shows out. You think about the teams that got to step up and win a game to keep their season alive. And then I'm excited to see which freshmen, which young guys step up in the Big Ten tournament and propel themselves into their sophomore season. A lot of storylines that we will get to over the next hour, but I will tell you that my madness always begins with the conference tournament, certainly here with the Big Ten tournament. It may begin with the official March Madness next week, but all the madness begins with all the bids, all the seeds being determined, who can get in, who's out, and obviously the storylines in conference tournaments like this one. A lot of jockeying for position, and that's something that we're going to see over the next five days, and we'll talk about the teams that have a chance to enhance their standing in the NCAA tourney bracket. Maybe some who feel like it's a little bit tenuous, need a win or two here. All of that ahead. Again, 13 games coming up in the next five days, eight of them on the Big Ten Network. Our big story is that bracket. Purdue is the one seed for the second straight year. They're the first school to have back-to-back one seed since Michigan State did it five years ago. Illinois, Nebraska, Northwestern, the other two double buys. Four teams play tonight, starting with Maryland and Rutgers, Penn State and Michigan to follow that. Minnesota, Michigan State is the first game tomorrow. Ohio State and Iowa will tip off the evening session. Wisconsin and Indiana await tonight's winners. So, guys, what's got you the most fired up as you look at that bracket? I can remember back in 2015, my Purdue team, we needed to beat Penn State to get into the tournament. If we lost to a Penn State team, we probably weren't going to make the big dance. So I'm looking at Iowa. I'm looking at IU. I'm looking at Ohio State. Which one of those bubble teams are going to win some games, make a run, and go dancing at the end of the season? I'm really curious to see if Ohio State can keep this going. Yeah, there's no question that 10-7 game is an elimination game. The team that loses in that game has no shot. The team that wins has a chance. You know, for me, it's Michigan State. In that 8-9 matchup, the Spartans, the metrics, do like them. Uh, Baylor, Indiana State, Illinois, all good wins. But they're in a bit of a tenuous spot. They're sort of hobbling in here. They had a chance to beat Indiana on the road, didn't get it done. If they lose this game to the de facto home team, the Minnesota Golden Gophers, I think they're really going to sweat, maybe not just getting in on Selection Sunday, but where they may play because they could be a candidate for Dayton if they lose to Minnesota. Could certainly see that. As you said, they have some high-level wins this year. I mean, you look at the brackets. They're in all the brackets right now. And I know you're not suggesting that they're not in. But they're also 8-13 and 13 against quads 1 and 2. This would be a quad 2 game here against Minnesota. You talk about the challenge. You know that Minnesota will have a, a home crowd advantage here. So all of a sudden, if you find yourself are you six games under, against the top two quads, maybe you are a candidate to go to Dayton. Again, a Michigan State team that's been to 25 straight NCAA tournaments. We expect them to be in that bracket Sunday. I think your question is, yeah, where might they be? Any other year, Yeah, maybe it'd be more tenuous. Right. But the back part of the bubble is so weak, and some of these other teams are losing. Uh, I do think they would get in, but where they are and what seed – could be determined by that Minnesota game. Oh, this is a tournament that's had a fair amount of parity through the years. Seven of the last ten tournaments have seen a different team win this thing. So seven different champs over the last ten years, which gets us to our big stat presented by Old National Bank. Purdue is looking to win it back-to-back. Only three schools have ever done that. Michigan State in the early years of the tourney, including the national championship team in 2000. Ohio State did it in 2010 and 2011 under Thad Mata. And then John Beeline's Michigan Wolverines, they won consecutively in 17 and 18. Remember, they won four games in four days both of those years. Let's get into Purdue. They are the favorite. And, Rafael, you and I talked about this a little bit on Monday, and I still contend as much as – we're interested to see what they do in this tournament. Right. This year is going to be defined for Purdue by what they do in the NCAA tournament, right. whether or not they avoid an early upset. And I think more 
importantly, whether or not they're able to get to a Final Four. Like, to me, I think that's going to be the defining characteristic of whether or not this year is a success. However, this could be a launching pad for them. It's a chance to enhance and maybe lock up that number one overall seed. There's still some stuff on the line here for Purdue. But what are you interested in seeing, cognizant of the fact that they know that people are really going to remember what happens in the ensuing weeks. This is why I love this Purdue team, because they may know what people are saying about them, but they just don't care. They care about winning championships, and the Big Ten tournament is an opportunity for them to win another championship. If you think about their senior class, they won outright Big Ten Conference last year. They won the Big Ten tournament last season. Now they have the chance to do it again and run it back. That is a special opportunity. 20 years from now, when these dudes are sitting around, they're looking at each other, they're talking to former guys they played against, they look at them and say, we dominated you guys two seasons in a row because you look at what they had this season. They had the coach of the year, assistant coach of the year, the player of the year, two guys on first team. This is a time where they got to show up and dominate this tournament. They can't just look past it. I mean, first of all, there's so many similarities between 2018-19 Virginia and 23-24 Purdue. That Virginia team was better in 19 than it was in 18. The core of it came back. Same thing here. This is a better Purdue team mm -hmm. than last year. Zach Eady's better. The additional Lance Jones. Braden Smith is better. Fletcher Lawyer, more confident. Yep. Um, all the pieces are there. I also think there really is no excuse for them not at least to get to Detroit because the thing that is on the table for them is they're going to be playing essentially at home. Whether they're one overall or not, they're going to be playing in Indianapolis. That is a lock right. next week. So you're going to have your first two games at Cambridge where they've already played this year beat Arizona, so they're familiar with the environment. I cannot see a scenario. It would be a major face plant if they don't win those two games. I don't care who the 8-9 is in Indianapolis to get to Detroit. And then also, you are in a little bit of a Big Ten home area. It is setting up for them to win four games to at least get to Glendale. It will be a major disappointment. Can't, can't hide from it yes. if they don't get the Glendale because of what's in front of them and where they're going to play. And I would say they're not hiding from it, right? Like Matt Painter, one yes. thing that I – I mean, there are tons of things I respect about Matt Painter. But one thing I've respected about him this year is he has not said – he has made no excuses for what happened last year. Right. And he has just taken it head on and said, hey, we know that what happened wasn't acceptable and we know that we're going to be defined by what happens. I would say, like, when you talk about, well, what can they get out of this? Part of it is playing with that confidence, reinforcing some of the things that have gone well. Like, you mentioned Fletcher Lawyer, right? Like, yep. Fletcher Lawyer is so much better yep. right now than he was two weeks ago. No, right? Can, can, can Fletcher Lawyer continue to play at the level that he has recently? Like to, to me, that's where you can do a lot of stuff that reinforces everything that you've done all year. Real quick, I just want to say, and, and you're around the program a lot, but I was there Sunday, and Zach Eady doesn't hide from it either. No. I no. mean, <laughs> right after the game, when I interviewed him on Sunday afternoon, he spoke about it. Yeah. He knows they are going to be defined yeah. and judged by what happens in the tournament. Not this tournament, the next one. Yeah, that's who Zach is. Zach Eady cares about things like that. I made a comment at an under four during a Northwestern Illinois game, and Zach Eady heard that. He said, well, Ray, you don't think this X, Y, and Z? Zach Eady cares about what's going on around Purdue. He cares about what's going on around him. He wants this team to win as many championships as they can before he gets out of Purdue. He doesn't want to just go down as two-time national player of the year, back-to-back -back Big Ten player of the year. Zach Eady wants to be the best player to ever play at Purdue University, one of the best players to ever play college basketball. He gets Purdue due to a Final Four to a national championship, he enters that conversation. Already has his number hanging from the rafters, maybe a championship banner as well. Certainly he would love that, a national championship banner. Uh, what about Illinois? They are the other team with a chance at a top four seed. How important do you believe this tournament is for them, Andy, to secure that? I think they could be a three for, sh for sure, and that obviously could potentially play into where they play and who they play next week. They're rolling right now. That win Sunday over Iowa was a significant victory, not just because of how they've been playing offensively, but defensively. And also, keep in mind with the selection committee, it, every game is treated individually. So they're going to have quad one type games, you know, if they continue to get to the final on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So their profile is going to rise up on that seed line. And I think they can get to a three. And I do think that they want, you know, obviously they want to win this, but I mean, I think they, the momentum they could have off of winning this 
potentially beating Purdue here on this floor really could catapult them as being one of those teams that could also get to Phoenix. Yeah, I think I think Illinois could be a Final Four team, no doubt. They went to Iowa City. They locked down one of the best offenses in the country. That defense they played against Iowa was just sensational. You hold one of the better teams in the country, under 65 points, under 40% from the field. Terrence Shannon showed why he's the best two-way player in the entire country. You think of Tony Perkins, one of the best players in the Big Ten. Two, not, the second team all-conference can score at will. Terrence Shannon put him in a vacuum. One of ten from the field, only two points against Terrence Shannon. He was big time. If they put that defense with that special offense that they have, getting out of transition, Marcus Domask in a half court, this is the Illinois team that could be really, really special going deep in March. That has been the missing element. And as you said, it wasn't just a good defensive performance. It was a good defensive performance against an elite yeah. offensive team, one of the best offensive teams in the country, 61 points for Iowa, a season low. That's been the missing piece for the fight. Alana, we know how dynamic they are offensively, so lots to build on here as they try to get a championship on Sunday. We are back at the Target Center, home of the Minnesota Timberwolves, the Minnesota Lynx, and coming soon, arena football team, the Minnesota Myth, coached by Ricky Foggy, Big Ten legend. How good is that? But this week, it's Big Ten hoops taking center stage. I go on about Ricky Foggy for <laughs> Weeks. The All Big Ten teams announced yesterday Zach Eady and Boo Booey, the two unanimous first team picks by both the coaches and the media. Those two joined on the coaches' first team by Terrence Shannon, Marcus Damask of Illinois, Braden Smith of Purdue. The media had Jameer Young on its first team rather than Damask. Let's take a look at the second teamers Tyson Walker, AJ Store, Kase Tomanaga, Tony Perkins joining Young on the coaches second team, while Minnesota's Dawson Garcia and Khalil Ware of Indiana were both on the media's second team, along with Damask. Run through the third teamers. They included Peyton Sanford, Ace Baldwin Jr., Rink Mass, Brooks Barnheiser, Bruce Thornton, Coleman Hawkins. You see the whole group here, but those are the ones who did make second team. It roughly went, I would say, as we expected. What stands out to you, Andy, as you look at those teams? Winning matters. And I think there should have been a consensus. No offense to Jameer Young, but Maryland's playing on Wednesday. Uh, it should have been Domask consensus. Also, where's Juwan Gary? You know, defensive team, he needs to be there. And how about the other Hawkins? One of the best playmakers in the country. Elijah Hawkins was on my ballot. He should have been somewhere on there as one of the best point guards in the country. So I, there's some omissions that I was a little troubled by. Also, I think it is kind of confusing. Coaches, media, co I think there should just be one ballot for everybody. I agree with you, Andy. I agree with those same omissions. And then I look at Braden Smith. Braden Smith was a kid coming into Purdue, ranked in the 300s. He committed to Purdue, and Purdue fans were still saying, we need a point guard in the transfer portal. And I remember going up to Braden Smith, asking him how he felt about that, going into his freshman year. He looked at me and said, Ray, I don't care. I'm going to be a great point guard in this league. I'm going to win games. And you think about going last season, they won the Big Ten by multiple games at Purdue. Only Zach Eady made an all-conference team, and that stuck with Braden. Coming into this season, Braden didn't make any preseason team. He wasn't considered as one of the best guards in the Big Ten. And what does he do? He goes out and have one of the best seasons as a point guard that we've seen in the Big Ten. And then he also makes first team all-Big Ten, makes an all-American team. Braden Smith is having one of the best sophomore seasons that we've seen in a long time. He's really stepped it up since that seven point seven turnover game against FDU. If I can just piggyback there, the great thing about Edie, Smith, and Boo Booey is they came in as freshmen. They stayed at their school. I mean, obviously Smith's only two years in, and but you know, he could have left. Yep. There was some chatter out there that he was gonna be in the portal or or people were trying to get him into the portal, I should say. Not him wanting to be, but people were trying to get him into the portal and take him. And he wanted no part of that. He wanted right. to stay in West Lafayette. But those three guys first team consensus by everybody and they were sort of the traditional model not the transfers yep, coming right. into this league and, and boo booey in particular i mean you think about those teams that he was on Man. in the early <laughs> years you think about the guys who did choose yes. to leave he had lots of opportunities yes. to leave like anyone who thinks that guys who aren't in the portal don't have opportunities to leave and aren't well aware of them is fooling themselves yep. And yet he stayed. He becomes the first unanimous All Big Ten pick Big in Northwestern history. Again, was on every ballot. First team All Big Ten coaches and the media. Plenty of individual award winners to tell you about as well. E, the Player of the Year for both the coaches and media, 
Obviously, that to be expected. Ace Baldwin Jr. of Penn State, Defensive Player of the Year. He led the conference in steals. Remember, he won the A-10 Defensive Player of the Year last year. Mason Gillis, Sixth Man of the Year. Mackenzie Mbako, Owen Freeman sharing Freshman of the Year honors. Freeman, the first Hawkeye to win it since our buddy Jess Settles 30 years ago. Brandon Brantley of Purdue, the Assistant Coach of the Year, while Matt Painter and Fred Hoiberg shared Coach of the Year honors. And Hoiberg engineering such an impressive turnaround. Let's dive into a couple more teams as we go team by team. That's a good jumping off point, I'd say, to talk about Nebraska. I mean, here they are, a team that was picked 12th. <laughs> they are the third seed. Yeah. They are almost certainly, I mean, I can't imagine a scenario where they don't play in the NCAA tournament, ending the longest drought in the Big Ten, 10 years without being in the dance. He has done a masterful job. And this is a really good team that no one wants to play right now. And he's done it his way. Went out and got guys that fit the mode of how he wants to play at Nebraska. Tough, physical, grown men style basketball players that give their all on the defensive end. Because I've been in that situation that Nebraska was in. Last season, they were at the bottom of the Big Ten. Last two seasons being at the bottom of the Big Ten. Had guys transfer out, had guys go pro, had guys leave the program for dead. And then you had guys stick around. You got to give credit to guys like Derek Walker, Sam Griesel, Emmanuel Bandemil that built the foundation of this team, especially at Derek Walker. I remember being in shoot around two seasons ago, and Derek Walker looked like he hated to play basketball in Nebraska because those guys around him just did not care. Last season, he got the ship going in the right direction. KSA Tominaga was a great pickup. Juwan Gary was a great ad. Coach changed his philosophy from being so much offensive base to defensive base. It's been nothing short of big time with coaches put together. I think Fred would be the first to admit that what he did at Iowa State wasn't going to work in Nebraska in hindsight. But I think he tried to copy it, yes. which was basically have almost like a CBA roster. Mm. You know what I mean? Come in, come out. You know, he had that pro mentality. Guys are there for one year, and we're just going to roll out the ball and just get it going. Yep. And it worked at Iowa State, goes to the NBA, then comes back to Nebraska. And I think that's what he initially tried to do in Nebraska, and he had to make that switch. And he's got more program guys, yep. high character culture guys that fit yep. the team aspect that are about the team, not about how am I going to get to the combine quick enough. And it has worked. And by the way, they also stayed healthy. Yep. That's been a little bit of a Achilles heel for them the last couple no of years. No pun intended. Yes, yes. Hmm. because they've had a lot of injuries. They didn't have that this year. I mean, Gary's out, what, just a couple of games or so. But for the most part, they've stayed healthy. And they also created a tremendous home court. Yep. You ask any coach in the league right now, what is the top five toughest home courts? Lincoln's going to be on there. Yep. And right. one thing they have is road definition. Each guy, they know who they are. They know who should be shooting, when they should be shooting. And then if they are not shooting the basketball, if they're not the one scoring the ball, they all give their all on the defensive end. This is a true team. They're tough to scheme for because you don't know who's going to come out and be their leading guy. It could be Casey, one of the hardest cutters off the basketball in the country, one of the best shooters off the ball in the country. Juwan Gary's tougher than he is on film. I really like where this Nebraska team is headed. It's interesting, too. I think if you would have told me two years ago, hey, no. Nebraska is going to make the tourney in two years. I don't know that I would have been shocked. Fred Hoiberg is a great coach with a great track record. But if you would have told me that they'd be the fourth most efficient defense in conference play in the Big Ten, I would have been shocked, yep. right? Because kind of to your point of what the model was, first of all, at Iowa State, he was taking a ton of transfers, as you said, before anyone else was doing it, right? right? Now the whole world is transfers. Right. And so you, your uniqueness is lost there. But also – they were 14th in the Big Ten in defensive efficiency two years ago, and they're, they're fourth this year. So kind of this notion of changing the mindset, getting those players who really believe in, in what they want to do, I, I think it's an incredible coaching job. Again, very deserving of the co-coach of the year along with Matt Painter. What about Northwestern? Uh, of course, last year they were the story. They were the number two seed in the Big Ten tourney. A lot of people, I think, looked at that season as a little bit of an anomaly. They lost Chase Adiz, who was the co-defensive player of the year, and there was a thought they'd take a step back. This is a team that was picked eighth in the Big Ten. And then, unlike Nebraska, Andy, they have had terrible injury luck. I mean, they're down two starters right now, and yet they just keep on winning. It's almost unheard of to have three coaches of the year, but – you easily could add Chris Collins as a co-co-coach of the year because what he has done with this group and his entire staff, and they have a great staff that has stayed together, is remarkable. Because not only did they, 
you know, changed this season the way they were going to play at the beginning of the year, and they were one of the most efficient offenses in the country mm -hmm. with Ty Berry scoring well early on. Nicholson, who wasn't playing well, then suddenly was a great dump-down dunker, you know, during that stretch in the middle of January. Then they all get hurt, and so now you've got to shrink the court even more. You've got, an obviously, an All-American in Boo Booey, but they really had to just grind everything. And then there were a couple games where they didn't even have Ryan Langborg. And they were essentially down almost three guys, uh, and they sort of ran out of steam in that one Iowa home game. But for them to come back, to me, that Maryland win, yeah. you know, it, I would circle that. It's not going to get the hype it deserves, but that road win at Maryland, when it came, who was on that roster, how Maryland had been playing, because Maryland had just won at Rutgers a game, if I'm not mistaken, that yeah. you did. Yes. Okay. Um, and they were playing well. Yep. And they go into College Park, and they win that game so short. No Langborg in that game. Yeah. Yep. I mean, that to me is the win of the season, even though it's not going to get the hype of it. I remember we were talking early on preseason, and I was telling you, I don't think Northwestern should be picked to be bottom of the league. I thought Northwestern would come into the season and be really good. I didn't expect the injuries. I know they had a tough schedule. But you have one of the best leaders in college basketball. You have Boo Boy to go along with you. And when you have a guy like Boo Boy in your locker room setting the tone on both ends of the floor, off the court, it gives you a chance. I think Boo Boy has been sensational. Guys around college basketball that struggle early in their career, they should be able to learn from Boo Boy. Because Coach Collins, he took a chance on Boo. Coming out of high school, he was wasn't highly recruited. Coach took a chance, and then Boo turned around and took a chance on his coach. Boo could have transferred out like Ryan Young, like Pete Nance. He could have left that program and tried to go find better. He decided to stay in it. He met, It was a mess. He decided to stay and fix it, and it's been big time. He's not going to go down to just a unanimous All-Big Ten guy, an All-American. Boo Boo, in my opinion, I talked to some of the Northwestern guys, this is the best player to ever play at this university. We are watching history in real time. Boo Boo has been sensational on and off the court all year long. They finally deservingly put Billy McKinney's number up there. I will be shocked if in our lifetimes we don't see number zero up yeah. at Welsh Ryan. Do you, are you agree? He's the most important player, I would say, in Northwestern history. I don't think there's any question about it, just based on kind of what has happened here these last two years. Chris Collins now with another chance to kind of build it after they had the, yeah. the breakthrough team in 17, and it, it kind of fell apart a little bit. Now they've gotten it back to this point. And, again, Boo Booey's loyalty and his skill – a huge part of that, but it has been a, a pretty remarkable story. First time they finished top three in the Big Ten in consecutive years in 64 years. Mm. Pretty remarkable. Mike DeCourcy released his latest seed list on FoxSports.com today and included six Big Ten teams. Purdue still the number one overall seed. Illinois remains a four seed. Wisconsin the best of his six Seeds, and then you saw Northwestern, Nebraska nines, Michigan State at 10, and Iowa in the first four out. All right, let's focus in on a couple more teams that do not know their first round opponent as we work our way down the list, starting with Wisconsin. They were number six in the nation, Andy, at one point. Now they are a five seed in the Big Ten tournament. So, needless to say, it hasn't gone great here down the stretch for Wisconsin. Losers of eight of 11. How can they get things going in the right direction here? Okay, first off, I think the Rutgers win. I talked earlier about the Maryland road win for Northwestern. I think the home Rutgers win the other night was as important as a win as they've had this entire season. It sort of reset for them. It was a game they had to have because of what was looming days later, which was Purdue on Sunday. I was there. They lost. But I was impressed. Uh, and I wasn't the only one. I thought the way they handled the early onset pressure from Purdue, the atmosphere, the senior day. I mean, they were within four points multiple times. They were right there to potentially win that game. Um, and, you know, overall, I like their mojo. And I think they've recaptured some of it here. We'll see what happens in this game on Thursday, uh, if they can get some of it back, whether they play Rutgers or Maryland. But I think they're, they're, they're creeping back to what they were. I don't think we'll see as good as they were in January, but I think they've got a chance now to go in 
to the NCAA tournament with a little bit of momentum and maybe win a game or two. Yeah, although they lost to Purdue at Becky Arena on senior day, I thought it was extremely encouraging to see what those guys put together. Tyler Wall, he had one of his better performances of the year, 17 and 10 on the road. John Blackwell, the freshman, played his best game of the year. He was awesome offensively and defensively. And A.J. Stewart, he got back going offensively, 17 points in the ball game. But Stephen Crowell did not score. And Wisconsin is not going to win many basketball games if Stephen Crowell isn't effective. He's a guy that when he's going, it helps everybody else on the floor. It spreads the floor for A.J. Stewart, Chucky Hepburn, and those guys to get driving lanes. When Stephen Crowell is knocking down shots from deep, it takes your defensive center away from the basket. It allows A.J. Stewart to go drive to the rim, get those highlight dunks, those highlight plays. Max Klesman starts coming off those curl screens. Steven Crowell means so much to this team. If he's not scoring, he's at least got to shoot the basketball and be a threat from deep or be a threat in the post. I, I agree with you, and, and Winter then has to come off the bench if that happens and add something. Yep. Um, and then the other X factor that happened against Rutgers because he played for is Sully McGee's back. Yep. You know, Kamari yep. McGee coming off the bench, providing energy, a little scoring pop, a little defense, yep. and just it's it felt like he lifted their spirits in that Rutgers game and now they have a little bit more depth, you know, on the perimeter. When you think about Kamari McGee and John Blackwell, when when Wisconsin started to struggle, those guys went down. And when you play a team like a Rutgers or an athletic team, you need a Kamari McGee to keep a Jameer Young in front. You need right. guys like that, athletic guys on the wing, that can keep the basketball in front and then attack the rim off the bounce. And they have to defend better. I mean, you look at, like, what's gone wrong in this 11-game stretch. A lot of it is defensive. I mean, their opponent's about 40% from three-point range. So not just keeping guys in front, but getting a hand the shot. in their face <laughs> as well. Uh, Indiana, really the opposite of Wisconsin, Ray I mean, this is a team that was left for dead. And now here they are, four straight wins, a couple of them against really quality high-end opponents. And all of a sudden, there's a conversation that – if Indiana could figure out a way to make some sort of a run here, maybe they can get themselves into that NCAA tourney conversation, particularly cognizant of what Andy said, that the bubble is pretty weak. Yeah, I love what Indiana's been doing. A couple weeks ago, Coach Woodson made the decision, put the basketball in Trey Galloway's hands and let him be the point guard and run the show. And Trey has done a great job. Three of the last seven games, he's had 11-plus assists in the ball game, getting everybody on the floor involved offensively, setting the table, making guys feel good. Because sometimes on the basketball floor, if a guy's not shooting it much, he just wants to touch the basketball. And then they give their all on defense. I think Indiana's done a better job defensively with their toughness meter. And then Khalil Ware, he's been awesome. Three of the last four games, 25-plus points, averaging over 12 rebounds a game the last four games. He's playing like a lottery pick. And McKenzie Mbako, as he picked up his play, he's playing like a lottery pick. Now you have two bona fide NBA players that go along with a senior point guard in Trey Galloway, and those role guys have really bought into the defending, playing hard at the max level. Anthony Leal's a big credit to that. They figured it out at the right time. I hope it's not too late. You know, sometimes it's pretty simple. Their best players are playing well yeah, exactly. at the right time. Yes. And they weren't earlier in the season. Obviously, Xavier Johnson was hurt. But the best players are playing well. And the brackets actually, I mean, if they can get to that semifinal against Illinois, yep. and if they could beat Illinois and somehow get to the final, I think they'd be in. You know, I mean, based on what happens around the country. Because then you've got a Nebraska win and an Illinois win. That'd be pretty good. Again, you look at some of these metrics. I mean, Bart Torvik's site, for instance, gives him less than a 1% chance to make the NCAA tournament. So I, you know better than I do. You've gone through the exercise of, of putting the bracket together. Uh, again, obviously, if they win it, they're in. But does getting to the, the championship game, knocking off a couple teams along the way? Who, we, I, you know, so none of this happens in a vacuum, obviously. Yeah, so much is contingent I, I, about I, what happens elsewhere. But it all matters who you play. Yeah. We know for sure that whoever they play in the first game is not going to help them. Not going to help. Right. But you beat a Nebraska, that helps you, and you'd have to beat an Illinois. Yeah. If it's Ohio State or Iowa, that's not going to help you. So if you beat Illinois in a semi and then you're playing Purdue and lose to Purdue in a final, yeah, in all that scenario, which is plausible, they could get in. This is a team that has not had a whole lot of success here, to say the least. They've yes. won multiple games in the Big Ten tourney just once in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. That was two years ago, And though, that got them in. If you recall, and yes, that got them, got them in into Dayton. To the NCAA tournament. So we shall see. It's why they play the games, as we like <laughs> to say. Don't forget, our tourney coverage tips off tomorrow. A quadruple header of action both Thursday and Friday here on the Big Ten Network. Starts at noon Eastern time, Minnesota and Michigan State. Four games in all, both days. Tomorrow, Ohio State, Iowa gets us going in the evening session. It's the Big Ten Men's Basketball Tournament presented 
by TIAA here on the Big Ten Network and as always on the Fox Sports app. So let's dive into those matchups that are set. And we talked a little bit about Michigan State in the context of this game against Minnesota. Andy, again, I don't think we're in a position to say this is a must win for Michigan State, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to win it. <laughs> Look, if they don't get it, as I said at the top of the show, I still think they're in, but they're going to sweat their seed and their sight because they could end up in Dayton based on what would happen around the country if there's upsets and bid stealers and the like. Um, they've played well. We saw, obviously, what happened against Northwestern um, late. On the road, they haven't, though. On the road, they've had chances to win multiple games, especially Sunday at Indiana. Uh, they're not going to get much out of the five. We know that. That's the strength of Minnesota. Yep. I mean, if Pharrell Payne has a big game, then they're in trouble. No question about it. Uh, and, and But the thing is, we saw the Gophers on Saturday night, and that, that was kind of disappointing. I think their last two games have been disappointing. There's so much there's talent. so much on the line. Yep, yep. And, and, and Come out flat. Yes, I don't get it. And I look at this Michigan State team, it can't just be Tyson Walker. Tyson Walker was amazing in their last game, 30 points, half of their point total. You've got to have all of your best players playing their best at this time of the season. A.J. Hogar, he's got to step up in a big way. Jay Nakins, he's got to step up in a big way. Malik Hall has got to be that Malik Hall from a couple weeks ago where he was double-figure points, double-figure rebounds. You could count it. You could book it. If those guys aren't going to step up, this is going to be a short end to the season for Michigan State. And then for Minnesota, like you said, Dave, I was disappointed at their effort in their last game. But it's a thing where Minnesota's got to have Elijah Hawkins be the guy offensively. In games where Dawson Garcia, where he scored 30-plus 30 30 points in ball games this season, three different times, they've lost all three of them. Teams are wanting them to go to Dawson Garcia, throw the ball inside, make the offense stagnant, and we're going to shut down Mike Mitchell. We're going to shut down Cam Christie. You're not going to have those ball screen lives to Pharrell Payne at the rim. They've got to find a way to have some balance. Yes, let Dawson Garcia eat down low, let him have his way, but then find a way to mix in those other guys. That last game, Mike Mitchell shot the ball from deep two times. Cam Christie only four times. Those guys got to make shots for them to win. I don't want to speak for Purdue, but I think Purdue would rather play Michigan State yep. because Minnesota, if you remember, yep. in West Lafayette, they gave them a game. Yep. Uh, and they've got the pieces if they're playing to their potential. And now, suddenly, if you're playing on Friday, even though it would be during the day again, maybe it gets more support, becomes more of a road game for Purdue. I think that's more of a difficult game for the Boilermakers than if Michigan State were to win. No doubt that front line provides a challenge for anyone. I mean, Minnesota is as big and as talented. Well, maybe not quite as big as Purdue, but they're as talented right. as – Right, I mean, Garcia, yeah, I mean, we no, didn't mention absolutely. him. They got three guards that can score the yep. ball. Yep, Do you agree that's a tougher game, Purdue? No, I'll agree because you think of Minnesota, three guards that can score the basketball. You can't hide Fletcher Lawyer or Brain Smith on anybody. And then Pharrell Payne at his highs with his ability down low, being able to be physical with Zach Eady, And then Dawson Garcia, he can score at will on anybody Purdue puts on him. Let's get to Iowa and Ohio State. We saw Mike DeCourcy has Iowa among his next four out. Again, you have to squint a little bit to see it with Ohio State, but it's not unreasonable to think with the way that Ohio State has been playing here that if they put together a nice run, Andy, they could find themselves in that bubble conversation. Remember, they put together a great run in this tournament just a year ago. So give us a sense of that matchup there and how you see each one of those teams in terms of the tourney conversation. Well, the selection committee never likes those of us on television to say an elimination game, but this is an elimination game. You're not getting in if you lose, in other words. There's no way. Yeah, There's yeah, no way absolutely. the loser of this game right. has a chance to get in as an at-large. The winner still has a pulse. And there's no question that Ohio State, uh, you know, whether it was going to happen regardless, whether it's Jake Diebler, the staff, who knows, they always had this talent because they won games early in the year. Yep. That Alabama win was this group of guys. I mean, it's not some, you know, they didn't have new players that came. Right. So they had good wins earlier in the year, notably against Alabama. They're playing well. The Purdue win clearly maybe wasn't as much of a fluke as we thought at the time because they've backed it up right. with other quality wins. And so I think they come in here with a lot of momentum, with something significant to play for. And if they beat Iowa and go against Illinois, again, opportunity. If they beat Illinois and now they play either Nebraska or Indiana in a semi and get to the final, again, like Indiana, 
I think they get in. And I love what you said, Andy. You said they don't have new players, but they have more players contributing now in this season. The game against Rutgers, 10 different guys scored in the game, nine different guys played 10 plus minutes. And what does that do? For the guys on the floor, they can't just go out there and play lacks of days ago. Now they're looking over their shoulder knowing if I don't play hard, I'm going to come out of this basketball game and I might not get back in it. You saw Coach bench Roddy Gale from a game and start Dale Bonner. He's switching things up. The biggest difference for this Ohio State team is in their defense for me. They were early on Big Ten Conference season. They were 13th in the league in defense efficiency. Now they're top five in the league. They put a, a concerted effort on the defensive end. They're playing with a purpose. I talked to Coach Owens a couple couple days ago, their assistant. He's raving about Felix Akpara, his defense at the rim, being able to block shots. They have multiple guys contributing on that end of the floor to go along with their three-headed monster in Jamison Battle, Bruce Thorne, and Roddy Gale to score the ball. They're night and day better on the defensive end. I mean, it's not even close how they're defending. This is going to be a real test, though, against a high-powered Iowa offense. No, for sure. Iowa's a team that can spread you out offensively with Josh Dix and Payne Sanford on one wing. Tony Perkins had his worst game of the season against Illinois, so you know he's going to be hungry to score the ball. And then we were talking about Owen Freeman being a freshman, being seven foot in this league. He's understood how to score the ball on the block. If this is a game where Ben Cricky's hooked up, they get some production off the bench, Iowa's a team that loves tournament-style basketball. They love to come in the gym, run up and down, shoot a bunch of threes, and get going offensively. First meeting between these two in Iowa City was a heck of a game. The entire game played in a nine-point window, so very competitive, and we expect nothing different coming up here tomorrow. We mentioned earlier, Iowa has the Big Ten co-freshman of the year in Owen Freeman. He was the nine-time Big Ten freshman of the week. Only Jared Sullinger has won that award more. More on Freeman in this excerpt from the Big Ten Network's original series, The Journey. Bowling. Things going for the Hawkeyes. Takes the shoot for Bowen. Drops it to the two-hand flush. Love this freshman. He is just scratching wow. the surface of what he can be. He can rim protect. Three blocks! Come on, Owen Freeman! He can score in the post. You can put him on the perimeter and he can rip and drive. He's got a complete skill set. Aaron White, Luca Garza, and the Murrays. They all came in here and contributed in a huge way as freshmen. When you look at Owen Freeman, his skill set is different, but his effectiveness and his ability to impact the game and his ability to impact winning is very similar. I was able to watch Luca and watch Keegan and just kind of be able to like, oh wow, like they're really good. My official visit, coach showed Lucas film and Aaron White's film and Tyler Cooks that showed different ways that I could fit in a system and fit in a basketball culture. I was kind of able to see how my game translated to the Iowa offense. It just allowed me to really envision myself here at Iowa and it just made that fit seem perfect. His high school team won a state championship. His AAU team won multiple championships. He very consistently performed at a high level. Then you come to college, and he's going against veteran guys. Guys in their fifth, sixth, seventh year. Most freshmen can't put it all together like he has. And he's gotten better as the year's gone on. For a true freshman to consistently put up the numbers he's putting up. Right to the rack again. While he's still figuring it out, the ceiling is playing in the NBA. Big man, steal and dunk. That's what his goal is, and it's our job to help him get there. Tonight's matchups in the Big Ten tourney starts with Rutgers and Maryland. 6.30 Eastern time tip over on Peacock. That is followed by Penn State and Michigan. And don't forget... The only place to get you ready for those games is right here on the Big Ten Network. Our Big Ten Live pregame comes your way at 6 Eastern time, 5 Central, only on the Big Ten Network and the Fox Sports app. 
We're going to do that for a half hour, but we're going to do an abbreviated version of it here. I don't want to in any way dissuade you from watching the entire program, but you'll get a little snippet of, of what the guys think. Let's start with Rutgers and Maryland, two great defenses, two of the best defenses in the country, two teams that have struggled on the offensive end. You've been talking about Maryland making a run yes. here for like three weeks. <laughs> okay. You look at Maryland in As the they have slipped. <laughs> down yes. in the standings, and but I still you are like still it. a believer. Yes. So make the case. Yeah, because you look at Maryland, they play Rutgers, and if I'm Maryland being athletic, being fast, be having Jameer Young, a strong point guard that can drive the ball, score in the lane, Julian Reese, one of the best big men in the conference, I look at Wisconsin, I feel like we could get that game. Now I look next, I look at Northwestern, I think a beat-up Northwestern team, limited big guys inside, I think Julian Reese, Dante Scott could dominate inside, and then you get to Saturday, you go against Purdue, we just never know what happens. But I like Ju Juju in this game against Rutgers. Juju's been averaging 20 points a game this season against Rutgers and Cliff Amore. Jameer Young is a superstar. And in tournament settings, young guys play better. Deshaun Harris-Smith, Jamie Kaiser, offensively, they're going to take Maryland to the next level this week. I didn't get the memo. <laughs> you know, he's already filled out his bracket, okay? <laughs> and uh, I guess I got to do that before tip-off. And, yes, he has Maryland <laughs> going all the way. No cap in my rap. <laughs> to play in Purdue in the semifinal. Wow. Yep. Uh, look, I'm going to talk to both these head coaches before for that pregame show, and there's no question that both of them are disappointed that they're playing on Wednesday night because Maryland, we talked to them, you know, talked to them in the preseason, Kevin Willard, they thought they had a team with everyone coming back that could challenge in the top four or five. Like third in the league. Yeah, and Rutgers, as great a recruiting class as they have next year, top five, they didn't think this was going to be sort of just a bridge year. They thought they could at least maintain it to some degree. So it's disappointing. So now you're going to see, you got something to play for. Can you make a run? Clearly, Ray Fell says Maryland will. <laughs> I'll be interested to see how healthy Julian Reese is because, exactly. remember, he yeah. sat out with a sprained ankle. But they just played in Piscataway. Andy, you were talking about that game, and Maryland annihilated them. I mean, I, right. I had the game, and – absolutely blew him out in the second half and, and really just limited anything Rutgers could do offensively. So, again, I admire your confidence, but I, but I, <laughs> but I don't think it's a struggle. Like, I understand right. why you're saying what yeah, you're saying. You can see it. You look at this roster and you say, you know, you got a first-team All-Big Ten guy, at least by in, in one of the teams on, you know, with Jameer Young. You have yep. Julian Reese, who's a double-double machine. Dante Scott, when he gets going, not out of the question to, to think that it could happen. All right, what about the team warming up here behind us? The Michigan Wolverines getting set to go through their shoot around. They will take on Penn State. We know how disappointing it's been for Michigan. Last place in the Big Ten, first time in 57 years. Penn State, I think, still playing with some confidence. What do you see from this matchup? It's going to be a big time point guard matchup. I look at Ace Ball and Doug McDaniel, two of the better guards in the league. Ace Ball, when being a defensive player of the year, shout out to him. I see him putting, blue, putting Doug McDaniel in a vacuum, not letting Doug McDaniel getting going. So for Michigan, who can step up and score the basketball? And then outside of Ace Baldwin for Penn State, which one of those guys are going to step up and make shots? Will it be Jamil Brown? Will it be Zach Hicks or Nick Curran cutting to the basket? Two quick points. One on Ace Baldwin. It's not easy to go from one league in the A-10 to be the defensive player of the year and do it again yep. in another yeah. that's obviously a step up in the Big Ten. So shout out to him and what Mike Rhodes has done. They have something to play for. Yep. They got some momentum. Could they get, you know, continue to play well? Some sort of postseason, we'll see. For Michigan, this is a pride right here. What kind of pride do you have? You finished last. You lost at home to Nebraska. What do you got? Do you want to stay in Minnesota? Do you only pack clothes for one day? Yep. We'll see. Exactly. It's interesting to think about Penn State, right? I mean, a team that had such a great run here last year. I understand it's a totally different group of players, but when you talk about teams that make runs in this tournament, Penn State is one of those, mm -hmm. right? Five of the last six years, they've won their Big Ten tourney opener. So this is a team with they some They can get to the here. semis. Absolutely. And they got those type Did of guys that don't get oh. tired. Yeah, oh, got, you don't. You, you haven't I got them winning their all first right, game. Right. I got them losing to Indiana. But Penn State, they could beat Indiana. They got guys that they could play two, three days in a row. They won't Second get there, tired. I thought you had them going all the way. No, I got the Hoosiers. Oh, you got Indiana. I got Indiana and Ohio State on that wow. side of the bracket. I, I feel like the we missed an opportunity to <laughs> show it. Ray Fell's bracket. Right. We should should go hold it up. Purdue, right Ohio the State in the championship. <laughs> uh, Big Ten Live pregame show, 6 Eastern. Bruce Weber will join the fun. We will see you then.